So there's two main parts to the university. There's the research enterprise and there's the educational uh, enterprise. And I definitely see both parts of it changing a lot in the next uh, decade or so. So speaking about the educational enterprise, it's not enough for people to learn the skills that they're learning today, as valuable as they may be, but it's, it's going to be very important for them to learn innovation skills that enable them to better communicate their ideas and communicate a value proposition, figure out how to make greater impact with their ideas by enrolling other people in their vision and to understand how to finance their idea and how to turn it into a sustainable business, nonprofit, uh, whatever form it is. Um, and so that's going to be really important. And it's, we think it's especially important at the, um, at the PhD level. Uh, we think that that's something that's been ignored. The fact that PhDs in fact, uh, Kurt Carlson, who's the CEO of SRI International, they're a nonprofit research lab in Menlo Park, he was, uh, he was giving a talk recently and he, where he said that their PhD students, uh, they, get, they get the most amazing PhDs around the, the world, to come, around the country, to come and work for them. And despite that, it takes them seven to ten years to become fully productive members of the team. And why is that? It's because they lack the innovation skills. They lack the skills of understanding how they fit into the innovation ecosystem, how they fit in, um, how they communicate their ideas, and how, how they address real-world problems. So that's um, perfect uh, validation for the fact that uh, USC, we're, we're, we just announced and we're launching for the fall a uh, innovation diploma program for PhD students that's free of charge for PhDs. It's a three-core sequence, um, unlike any other program that we're aware of. And we think it's really, really valuable for our students to not, we're not trying to turn PhDs into business people. Uh, we don't think that's appropriate. We don't think that it uh, always works. What we, we want to keep them as researchers and the, at the cutting edge of their field. And that's, that's their whole goal is to become the absolute best in a discipline. And there have been some criticisms that academics don't understand the bigger picture or they don't, they're too specialized. The reality is if you're going to be the absolute best, you have to be very specialized. But that doesn't preclude you from understanding how to communicate with others that can take your idea and make it into something uh, really impactful. So it's, it's sort of bridging that gap by making both the academics aware and then of course we'd like to focus on the, the business community as well to bring them closer to academia. There's a lot of changes that are happening now that are really going to be impacting the way innovation happens in the university. Uh, one of them, for example, is open access to research results. And um, people are publishing increasingly in open access journals. And in fact, I think there have been about 5,000 new open access journals that have popped up online in the last couple years that are circumventing the typical peer-reviewed printed journal publications. And that's really having, that will have some significant effect, I think, in the future. And it's not just a matter of open access to the papers, but also there's been a greater drive towards open access towards the, the data itself, which starts to, it, it's somewhat controversial because there's definitely an interest by faculty with all the work that they put into collecting that data. And this has been a challenge for, for a while, but it's exacerbated by this new open access, is uh, how do you get, the, get to benefit from your own data that you've worked so hard to collect and then and publish on. So how long is it appropriate to hold back that data before you share it with other people? Obviously, the sooner you get the data out there, the more people will benefit. And at the same time, you need to motivate faculty to be collecting that data in the first place. And so that's that will be an interesting thing to see. Um, also, digital scholarship um, is changing the output of research. So it used to be that you can do some research, you can write it up in a thesis or a paper, publish it, uh, or put it on a bookshelf, and, and that was your publication. That's not going to cut it anymore. Uh, you have digital uh, multimedia output that, how do you archive that? So for example, we have this program, this um, 
the system that was developed at USC in collaboration with some other universities called HyperCities. It's, it was developed by a historian, in fact, at, at USC and um, Phil Ethington. And what it is is you can put georectified maps and uh, geotagged photographs into the system and you can look at, for example, I can look at my neighborhood and then click on a button. It's a, it goes from the uh, view from the, from the sky, the satellite view, down into, well, let's see what the map looked like from 1986. Now let's see this other map from 1920 and you realize, oh my God, there's no marina there. And you can really go through, it's almost like going through time and seeing how things were. You can look at different photographs and very much in a crowdsourcing fashion, it enables other historians now. It's this platform where other people can add to this archive of information. So it brings up some interesting questions. One of the questions is, how do you, how do you uh, store and that kind of output if it's not a piece of paper that you can put in a library or you can scan in. Uh, how do you archive this? How do you enable people to access that information? And if you are allowing people to contribute to it, then how do you give proper credit to those individuals that are contributing to this piece of scholarship if there's now hundreds of people that are contributing to this? So this is very different. It's a brave new world. It's different from the way it was, say, 20, 30 years ago. And it's going to continue to change. It is an interesting challenge that in order to motivate people to excel and do things, it's part of human nature that you need to, there needs to be some sort of incentive. So in the market economy, it's very much based on financial rewards. In academia, it's very much based on reputation. And so either way, there's competition. I do think in academia, it's much more collaborative. So I think that although people can criticize academics at times for holding back certain research results, and it's not ideal, it's not optimal, uh, at the same time, I do think that, that um, there is a real sense of collaboration and the desire to have great, to, to, to create great results together. But I do think that there, we do have to be collaborating more, and we are collaborating more. Um, perfect example is the Human Genome Project. So that would not have come together unless you had uh, there's, um, many universities and researchers that came together to work for the greater good on this project. And ultimately, it was clear who the big contributors were. Uh, it's really a part of the whole ethic is to try to, to be able to track that. Um, but there are challenges because if you're, if you're starting to bring together lots of other people, you, know, you want to make sure that you, we need to make sure that we maintain that ethic for uh, providing acknowledgement to the people who contribute. Um, we have lots of big challenges ahead of us, uh, whether it's trying to reduce the cost of solar energy or trying to deliver clean water to, to the whole world. Um, or you know rene renewable energy in general um, and global warming, all of these things are going to really need to have large collaborations. And I don't know that we've completely figured that out yet. I also think that it will cause a bit of a, it's just a prediction that will cause some pressure and some challenge for, some, for, for universities because right now, especially the larger elite universities, they have large research enterprises that they can, build on and they can um, they can build on their reputation by bringing in more research dollars and to be doing more exciting research and at the same time if universities and universities are collaborating more on programs then the universities will maybe be asking themselves well how do we preserve our brand because brand is important in that collaboration um, so th there, there needs to be the universities as in individual universities need to have a value proposition so that it's not just a place where faculty sit and get a paycheck. You know, it's, it's really they, because faculty can take their research and they can move to another place. So it will put more pressure on universities to ensure that they're doing their jobs and creating that environment that innovative environment that enables people to collaborate and work together. And that's really one of the huge values of universities. And in you know, a place like USC, for example, we've been around for almost 130 years um, 
absolutely integral to the local community and also within our own. You know, we've built up this faculty over the years and that enables us to get the absolute best students to come through. And so it's, it's based on a real foundation and we need to, you know, as an example, we, we just need to make sure that we maintain that and we keep growing and we keep increasing that or else we're not going to be relevant. Thank you.